Hello, fourth grade. This is The Tale of Despero. This is book the third, which is The Tale of Miggery Sow. And this is chapters 30 through 33. The book that I'm reading from is the Scholastic Paperback Edition, which is a 2006 edition, and the text copyright is 2003. Chapter 30 To the Dungeon. At the castle, for the first time in her young life, Mig had enough to eat. And eat she did. She quickly became plump, and then plumper still. She grew rounder and rounder, and bigger and bigger. Only her head stayed small. Reader, as the teller of this tale, it is my duty from time to time to utter some hard and rather disagreeable truths. In the spirit of honesty, then, I must inform you that Mig was the tiniest bit lazy. And two, she was not the sharpest knife in the drawer. That is, she was a bit slow-witted. Because of these shortcomings, Louise was hard-pressed to find a job that Miggery Sow could effectively perform. In quick succession, Mig failed. As a lady-in-waiting, she was caught trying on the gown of a visiting duchess. A seamstress, she sewed the cloak of the writing master to her own frock and ruined both. And, as a chambermaid, sent to clean a room, she stood open of mouth and delighted, admiring the gold walls and floors and tapestries, exclaiming over and over again, Gore, ain't it pretty? Gore, ain't it something then? And did no cleaning at all. And while Mig was trying and failing at these many domestic chores, other important things were happening in the castle. The rat in the dungeon below was pacing and muttering in the darkness, waiting to take his revenge on the princess. And upstairs in the castle, the princess had met a mouse, and the mouse had fallen in love with her. Will there be consequences? You bet. Just as Mig's inability to perform any job well had its consequences. And finally, as a last resort, Louise sent Mig to the kitchen, where the cook had a reputation for dealing effectively with difficult help. In Cook's kitchen, Mig dropped eggshells in the pound cake batter. She scrubbed the kitchen floor with cooking oil instead of cleanser and she sneezed directly onto the king's pork chop moments before it was to be served to him. Of all the good-for-nothings I have encountered, shouted Cook, surely you are the worst, the most cauliflower-eared good-for-nothingest. There's only one place left for you, the dungeon. Eh? said Mig, cupping a hand around her ear. You are being sent to the dungeon. You are to take the jailer his noonday meal. That will be your duty from now on. Reader, you know that the mice of the castle feared the dungeon. Must I tell you that the humans feared it too? Certainly it was never far from their thoughts. In the warm months, a foul odor rose out of the dark depths and permeated the whole of the castle. And in the still, cold nights of winter, terrible howls issued from the dark place, as if the castle itself were weeping and moaning. It's only the wind, the people of the castle assured each other. Nothing but the wind. Now many a serving girl had been sent to the dungeon bearing the jailer's meal only to return white-faced and weeping, hands trembling, teeth chattering, insisting that they would never go back. And worse, there were whispered stories of those servant girls who had been given the job of feeding the jailer, who had gone down the stairs and into the dungeon, 
and who had never been seen or heard from again. Do you believe this will be Meg's fate? Gore, I hope not. What kind of a story would this be without Meg? Listen, you cauliflower-eared fool, shouted Cook. This is what you do. You take the tray of food down to the dungeon, and you wait for the old man to eat the food, and then you bring the tray back up. Do you think you can manage that? I, I reckon so, said Meg. I take the old man the tray, he eats what's on it, and then I bring the tray back up. Empty it would be then. I bring the empty tray back up from the deep downs. That's right, said the cook. Seems simple, don't it? But I'm sure you'll find a way to bungle it. Eh? said Mig. Nothing, said Cook. Good luck to you. You'll be needing it. And she watched as Mig descended the dungeon stairs. They were the very same stairs, reader, that the mouse Despero had been pushed down the day before. Unlike the mouse, however, Mig had a light. On the tray with the food, there was a single, flickering candle to show her the way. She turned on the stairs and looked back at Cook and smiled. That cauliflower-eared, good-for-nothing fool, said Cook, shaking her head. What's to become of someone who goes into the dungeon smiling, I ask you? Reader, for the answer to Cook's question, you must read on. Chapter 31, A Song in the Dark The terrible, foul odor of the dungeon did not bother Mig. Perhaps that is because, sometimes, when Uncle was giving her a good clout to the ear, he missed his mark and delivered a good clout to Mig's nose instead. This happened often enough that it interrupted the proper workings of Mig's olfactory senses. And so it was that the overwhelming stench of despair and hopelessness and evil was not at all discernible to her. And she went happily down the twisting and turning stairs. Gore, she shouted. It's dark, ain't it? Yes, it is, Mig she answered herself. But if I was a princess, I would be so glittering, light-like, that there wouldn't be a place in the world that was dark to me. And at this point, Miguri Sow broke into a little song that went something like this. I ain't the Princess P, but someday I will be. The P, ha ha, he he, someday I will be. Mig, as you can imagine, wasn't much of a singer. More of a bellower, really. But in her little song, there was, to the rightly tuned ear, a certain kind of music. And as Meg went singing down the stairs of the dungeon, there appeared from the shadows a rat, wrapped in a cloak of red and wearing a spoon on his head. Yes, yes, whispered the rat. A lovely song, just the song I have been waiting to hear. And Roscuro quickly fell in step beside Miggery Sow. At the bottom of the stairs, Mig shouted out in the darkness, Gore, it's me, Miggery Sow. Most calls me Mig, delivering your food. Come and get it, Mr. Deep Downs. There was no response. The dungeon was quiet, but it was not quiet in a good way. It was quiet in an ominous way. It was quiet in the way of small, frightening sounds. There was the snail-like slither of water oozing down the walls, and from around a darkened corner there came a low moan of someone in pain. And there was then, too, the noise of rats going about their business, their sharp nails hitting the stones of the dungeon, and their long tails dragging behind them through the blood and muck. 
Reader, if you were standing in the dungeon, you would certainly hear all of these disturbing and ominous sounds. If I were standing in the dungeon, I would hear these sounds. If we were standing in the dungeon, we would hear these sounds and we would be very frightened and we would cling to each other in our fear. But what did Miggery Sow hear? That's right, absolutely nothing. And so she was not afraid at all, not in the least. She held the tray up higher and the candle shed its weak light on the towering pile of spoons and bowls and kettles. Gore, said Meg. Look at them things. I never imagined there could be so many spoons in the whole wide world. There is more to this world than anyone could imagine, said a booming voice from the darkness. True, true, whispered Riscuro. The old jailer speaks true. Gore, said Mig. Who said that? And she turned in the direction of the jailer's voice. Chapter 32. Beware of the rats. The candlelight on Mig's tray revealed Gregory limping toward her, the thick rope tied around his ankle, his hands outstretched. You, Gregory presumes, have brought food for the jailer? Gore, said Mig. She took a step backward. Give it here, said Gregory. And he took the tray for Mig and sat down on an overturned kettle that had rolled free from the tower. He balanced the tray on his knees and stared at the covered plate. Gregory assumes that today again there is no soup. Eh? said Meg. Soup! shouted Gregory. Illegal! shouted Meg back. Most foolish! muttered Gregory, as he lifted the cover off the plate. Too foolish to be born! A world without soup! He picked up a drumstick and put the whole of it into his mouth and chewed and swallowed. Here, said Mig, staring hard at him. You forgot the bones. Not forgotten. Chewed. Gore, said Mig, staring at Gregory with respect. You eat the bones? You were most ferocious. Gregory ate another piece of chicken, a wing, bones and all, and then another. Mig watched him admiringly. Some day, she said, moved suddenly to tell this man her deepest wish. I will be a princess. At this pronouncement, Kiroscuro, who was still at Mig's side, did a small, deliberate jig of joy. In the light of one candle, his dancing shadow was large and fearsome indeed. Gregory sees you. Gregory said to the rat's shadow. Rizkuro ceased his dance, and he moved to hide beneath Mig's skirts. Eh? shouted Mig. What's that? Nothing, said Gregory. So you aim to be a princess? Well, everyone has a foolish dream. Gregory, for instance, dreams of a world where soup is legal. And that rat? Gregory is sure, has some foolish dream, too. If only you knew, whispered Riscuro. What? shouted Mig. Gregory said nothing more. Instead, he reached into his pocket and then held his napkin up to his face and sneezed into it. Once, twice, three times. Bless you! shouted Meg. Bless you! Bless you! Back to the world of light, Gregory whispered, and then he balled the napkin up and placed it on the tray. Gregory is done, he said, and he held the tray out to Meg. Done, are you? 
Then the tray goes back upstairs. Cook says it must. You take the tray to the deep downs. You wait for the old man to eat. And then you bring the tray back. Them's my instructions. Did they instruct you, too, to beware of rats? The what? The rats. What about them? Beware of them, Gregory shouted. Right, said Meg. Beware the rats. Rescuro, hidden beneath Meg's skirts, rubbed his front paws together. Warn her all you like, old man, he whispered. My hour has arrived. The time is now, and your rope must break. No nib-nib nibbling this time. Rather a serious chew that will break it in two. Yes, it is all coming clear. Revenge is at hand. Chapter 33 A Rat Who Knows Her Name Midka climbed the dungeon stairs and was preparing to open the door to the kitchen when the rat spoke to her. May I detain you for a moment? Mig looked to her left and then to her right. Down here, said Rescuro. Mig looked at the floor. Gore, she said. But you're a rat, ain't you? And didn't the old man just warn me of such? Beware the rats, he said. She held the tray up higher so that the light from the candle shone directly on Rescuro and the golden spoon on his head and the blood-red cloak around his neck. There is no need to panic. None at all, said Rescuro. And as he talked, he reached behind his back and using the handle, he raised the soup spoon off his head, much in the manner of a man lifting his hat to a lady. Gore, said Mig, a rat with manners. Yes, said Rescuro. How do you do? My papa had him some cloth much like yours, Mr. Rat, said Mig. Red like that. He traded me for it. Ah, said Rescuro, and he smiled, a large, knowing smile. Oh, did he really? That is a terrible story. A tragic story. Reader, if you'll pardon me, we must pause for a moment to consider a great and unusual thing. Now this great unusual thing is this. Rescuro's voice was pitched perfectly to make its way through the torturous path of Nig's broken down, cauliflowered ears. That is to say, reader, Miggery Sow heard, perfect and true, every single word the rat Rescuro uttered. You have known your share of tragedy, said Rescuro to Meg. Perhaps it's the time for you to make the acquaintance of triumph and glory. Triumph, said Meg. Glory? Allow me to introduce myself, said Rescuro. I am Kiriscuro. Friends call me Rescuro. And your name is Miggery Sow. And it is true, is it not, that most people calls you simply Mig. Ain't that the thing, shouted Mig. A rat who knows my name. Miss Miggery, my dear, I do not want to appear too forward so early on in our acquaintance. But may I inquire, am I right in asserting that you have aspirations. What do you mean, aspirations? shouted Meg. Miss Miggery, there is no need to shout, none at all. As you can hear me, so I can hear you. We two are perfectly suited, each to the other. Rescuro smiled again, displaying a mouthful of sharp yellow teeth. Aspirations, my dear, are those things that would make a serving girl 
wish to be a princess. Gore, agreed Mig. A princess is exactly what I want to be. There is, my dear, a way to make that happen. I believe that there is a way to make that dream come true. You mean that I could be the Princess P? Yes, your highness, said Roscuro, and he swept the spoon off of his head and bowed deeply at the waist. Yes, your most royal Princess P. Gore, said Meg. May I tell you my plan? May I illustrate for you how we can make your dream of becoming a princess? A reality? Yes, said Mig. Yes! It begins, said Roscuro, with yours truly and the chewing of a rope. Mig held the tray with the one small candle burning bright, and she listened as the rat went on, speaking directly to the wish of her heart. So passionately did Roscuro speak, and so intently did the serving girl listen, that neither noticed, as the napkin on the tray moved. Nor did they hear the small, mouse-like noises of disbelief and outrage that issued from the napkin, as Roscuro went on unfolding, step by step, his diabolical plan to bring the princess to the darkness. End of the third book.